let's let's go ahead and get rolling. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good to see you, Don. Matt, good to be here. It's uh, we've known each other forever, but I feel like during the lockdowns we haven't seen each other that much. No one's seen any yeah. anyone that th- much. Yeah, we've known it, each other for over th- well over thirty years. Yeah, yeah. I I think um, I think it's illegal to engage in human interaction. I'm not sure, but well, I can, well, we're, we're doing it in underground. So, yes, so I'm yes, glad. Is, uh, yeah. If 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 they kick the doors down, we'll we'll deny everything. I'll put my mask on very yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, a couple of days ago, you wrote an article that I've already forgotten the name of. I called, can't stop wondering about COVID. Yeah, at at uh, published by our good friends at AIER, mm-hmm. um, and we've had a number of AIER economists on the show, and and I, I it really sort of got me thinking. I mean, you didn't say anything that I hadn't been thinking all already, but you sort of put together this mystery that that I've been scratching my head over for now almost a year like what is what is going on what is the why are we so hysterical about this threat relative to all the other threats that humans face and and I'm not sure you figured it out either but you just asked the question it it, it mystifies me um, that particular question was sparked by something that Brian Kaplan who you are my colleague at GMU wrote several months ago uh, at Econlog, his blog, his and David Henderson's blog, and he said, look, he said, uh, let's compare COVID to the flu, and then shouldn't the reaction to COVID be proportional to COVID's dangers relative to the flu? And he got a lot of pushback on that, as if he was asking an insane question. And then you think about what we do with the flu, right? So we take flu shots, some of us do, stay home when you're sick. Flu kills people. These people get buried. They that their their uh, uh, funerals aren't filmed, television doesn't show them. They're not sensationalized, but we reacted to COVID a, a million times more. Yeah. And I I wish I had an answer for why. You know, we can all speculate. Media. It was a perfect uh, year with a, uh, an unpopular president that that it was easy to blame uh, for not doing enough to stop this disease. But it just has me mystified, Matt. You know, the, um, you, you just triggered a thought that I had never thought of before, but I remember the hysterical political reaction to George W. Bush's re, uh, response to Katrina. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, of course, um, was highly politicized. And, you know, Bush made the mistake of telling the head of, was it FEMA? FEMA, you're doing a heck of a job. Yeah, you're doing a heck of a job. And part of it, May have been a an honest critique of government incompetence, yeah. because government sometimes I don't want to shock you, but sometimes government doesn't get it right um, from time to time. But it also seemed politicized, and yeah. and you know I'm I'm not a Trump guy, but it strikes me that in a lot of ways what President Joe Biden is doing in response to the pandemic is not so different than what President Trump did, and. You know, we, we focus on the president, but there's this entire bureaucracy that is distributing um, uh, vaccines and all that stuff. Yeah. So part of it seemed political to me. It, it seemed like um, it seemed like partisans wanted to damage this guy so that they could get their guy. I have no doubt that's part of it. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not even saying it's conscious. It, it was just, we don't like Trump. Here's a bad disease. It's, it's killing some people. It must be because he's not doing enough. Because we know he's stupid and dumb and doesn't care. Yeah. So it, the, all this death, all, this, all, this, all these high rising caseloads, that must be because of his incompetence. Yeah. But, but perhaps more on like politics is politics and, and partisans are going to accuse the other team of, of being responsible for all sorts of things that, yeah. that a single person couldn't possibly be responsible for. But the, the, the more sort of dangerous threat in that, and this seems to be part of, of explaining the COVID puzzle, is we've gotten a po- to a point where that sort of progressive dream that the smartest people, the, the brightest scientists, the, the most noble of us could be given lots of power to reorganize things from the top down. And it, it, there seemed to be from day one this, this pretense that somehow um, politics combined with science could keep us from never ever getting sick. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And the the, it, the pretense of knowledge, one of Hayek's famous articles. By, by the way, uh, every time we quote Hayek, 
uh, there's a drinking game that goes on in this show. So oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so so let's let's get some people drunk and really we uh, rank up the Hayek here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this has always been the progressive dream, of course. That 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 society is a science project, and you know the unwashed masses, which just, makes people the mice, which in, makes people in, the mice and the guinea pigs, and 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 for a variety of reasons. Uh, the mice became truly frightened by this COVID thing. And so they became lemming-like to, to shift animals. And uh, so the great science experiment was on. Yeah. So we'll turn power over to the authorities, the apolit allegedly apolitical authorities, and they will protect the mice from this one danger. Forget about the other dangers. Uh, and and uh, uh, so this, this this pretense is, is just... I, I, I don't think it's too strong to say. I think civilization is under a real threat now. Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. And I, like, uh, um, in early March, I wrote my first piece on this, and and I happened to be with uh, Ben Powell and Bob Lawson. Yeah. We had actually planned a beach vacation, which was completely blown up by our fears of not being able to get back into the country. Yeah. So I, I wrote this piece on the beach um, before I had to flee home and hope that my government would let me come home. And I didn't know anything about the science of viruses except my personal experience not freaking out in the past. But I remembered uh, uh, Bastiat, the seen and the unseen. And there's that particular passage in I think Economic Sophisms where he talks about the, the mystery of how Paris is fed. Mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking to myself, as we close borders, and lock down economies and force people to shelter in place, um, there is going to be horrific unintended consequences. And, and I was imagining, and, and I, I didn't obviously get it exactly right, but I was imagining, um, to, to Bastiat's point about Paris, I was imagining potentially shutting down the distribution network that got food to our tables. And that hasn't happened happily, because that would be a catastrophe beyond words. But all of these unintended consequences of focusing on one thing as opposed to the, all the other things, um, it's, it's still something that seems to evade people that, you know, the, the Karens that will scold us yeah. for not sheltering in place. Exactly. Look, I, I'm not so much surprised by the Karens who will scold us. I'm not surprised by a lot of the political class and their reaction to this, because as you know, they uh, uh, habitually ignore unseen consequences. They habitually ignore the reality of the necessity to make trade-offs. They habitually uh, I ignore uh, that people have the fact that people have different preferences, including risk preferences. What has surprised me and disappointed me most is the number of people in the Freedom Caucus, the, the, those people who traditionally press for freedom, who under, who are appropriately skeptical of politicians, who are appropriately skeptical of the media that constantly report in a very simple-minded and juvenile way on economic phenomena. Many of these people have just gone, many have just gone silent. Yeah. A large number have just, I think, just gone uh, 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 crazy. I mean, because they're, they're, they're endorsing this nonsense. Yeah. If if you understand that when the media reports on the minimum wage and on on tax policy that their economics is all wrong and they're all, and they're looking at the world in a very simple minded way, why would you think when it's reporting on COVID that it's somehow become sophisticated and taking a, taking into account all the different variables that should be taken into account? Why would you trust the same politicians who you do not trust to meddle with the minimum wage to 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 to, to, to regulate uh, uh, to regulate drugs in normal times? Why why do you trust these people? Now, yeah, but a lot of our friends have just they 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 have lost their their judge their judgment. Yeah, and I don't understand it. It it actually reminded me. I, I felt like the the reaction to this. Are you for a bottom up decentralized solution that that really taps into local knowledge, or are you for a top down one size fits all government solution? It reminds me of some people's reaction to the Wall Street bailout where yeah. some people yeah. that ostensibly believed in freedom and markets said, well, this is different. Yeah. As George W. Bush said, we have to abandon the free market to save it. Yeah. And so there was that remnant, and it was small, particularly in Washington, D.C., 
that said, no, 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 this is precisely the time when we need markets and people to figure this out. Um, um, same thing with the war on terror after nine yep. 11, a lot of people sort of dropped their, their rational skepticism of government solutions. And, and of course we've built this massive, um, surveillance state. So I think it's, it's, it's an, it's, it's sort of a test of, uh, people's convictions in a way. So on that last point, I agree, you're completely correct. On that last point, uh, there are a number of people who I've encountered, I'll, I'll not name any names, who were appropriately disgusted by the rise of the surveillance state following 9-11, and who are now advocates of test and trace. Yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah. Right? I mean, forget about, I, I think it's just lunacy to think a test and trace is somehow an effective way to... To control, it's completely virus. unworkable. It's unwork. I mean, the virus is already out. I mean, this is this is a this is a complex social phenomena. We humans being we humans have dealt with these kinds of things for millennia. Uh, there's no getting back to the early point. There's no way science can, or no matter how powerful the state can, we can't we can't stop it. But if you if you dis if you distrust the state to do surveillance after 9/11 because of terror itself an overblown risk, right? People, uh, why trust the state with test and trace? That seems even, to me, even more intrusive and more scary. They're going to test me and they're going to trace where I've been and I can't get into places. I can't even leave my home just because of some some medical fact. Yeah, It's really scary. Why, um, and I'll, I'll go even further on that, um, I'm old enough to remember when the idea that the government would discriminate you, against you because of your health status would be the most horrific concept ever. And now, um, and it gets back a little bit to politics because not everybody that gets COVID is as guilty as the people that denied the wisdom of lockdowns and double masking and, and some of the more extreme mm -hmm. um, civic religions that we've now imposed on people. Yeah. Um, is it okay to discriminate against people because they might randomly get sick? Is this a thing? I, I think uh, I think it's not only okay now. I, I think it's considered laudable. Yeah. Uh, just just because you might, right? You're not wearing a mask. Uh, I, I I I know from some of the things you said that you're not all that worried about COVID. Therefore, you are a public enemy. Yeah. And so we should discriminate against you. I went to the Super Bowl. That's a sin. Yeah. I went to uh, well, Terry and I just did. Got did you by. go to the Super Bowl? No, no. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. I would have loved to, yeah. but I, yeah, I I, I I didn't know a guy. Okay, yeah. They could get me one of those seats next to the cardboard pop-ups. But uh, we did just get back from Guatemala. Um, and Oh, the Antigua Forum. Yeah, the Antigua Forum in Guatemala, which, which by the way, was incredibly liberating to, to go somewhere. I spoke with Andy Morris, who was there, and he said, that, just yesterday, he said the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And, we, and by the way, we, we gathered, and we were careful, but we didn't stop from, from doing things that human beings used to do. And nobody got sick, nobody got infected. Um, but I think that group, even if someone had, it would have been okay. Because yeah. you deal with it the same way you would deal with, with, with any virus in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, that's crazy talk now. Like I, I'm probably, this show's probably now banned from, from YouTube, but we'll see how that goes. Probably, yeah. 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 But, see you folks. Yeah, but um, I, wa I want to go back to that, you know, why have some libertarians and some classical liberals and constitutional conservatives i i'll use all those phrases mm -hmm. because we're this beautiful stew of of perspectives but they missed what i think was the fundamental hayekian point about radically uncertain circumstances if you don't know what's going on it seems like the most opportune time to let the market process work because yeah. the market process at least according to us Austrians is is the process of human beings acting and trying to figure out how to get a get ahead in a world that is radically unknowable in the future mm -hmm. and I'm like well if if this virus is radically unknowable wouldn't wouldn't a decentralized response a local response allowing scientists and innovators 
the freedom to, to figure it out. Wouldn't that have been the obvious thing to do? But the, you know, remember the, the narrative at the time is um, there are no libertarians in a pandemic. And I'm like, no, there has to be more libertarians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, of course, I, I agree completely with you. So a lot of people will say and have said, oh yeah, well, you know, particularly at the beginning with all this radical uncertainty. But what a lot of those people really meant is, or, or they interpreted radical uncertainty. And when they said it in their head, when they said those words, what they heard is unprecedented existential danger. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really think it was uncertain. Right. They, they must have, no, this is the only way that I can understand how they reacted. They must really have believed that this thing was akin to, like one of these old horror movie things, akin to some meteor that we, we know is headed toward Earth, it's going to hit us in a month, and if it hits us, it's going to destroy the planet. I think that's how they think about this. I, saw, I saw that movie, by the way. Yeah, okay. I, I forget what it's called. It's the one with Bruce Willis? With Bruce Willis, yeah, I yeah, saw yeah. it too. Yeah, it's a really stupid movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so, so um, uh, in their minds, there was no uncertainty. In their minds, it, it was certain death yeah. unless we all hunker down and, 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 and hide in foxholes or stay under house arrest. Yeah, Phil, Phil Magnus from AIER has done a tremendous job sort of Been heroic. debunking yeah. the, the pretense of knowledge in, in the modelers and how they, they sort of just dropped in these, these assumptions to get this really big number to get people ginned up. But yep. you know, one of their assumptions was um, there's not a single human being that's going to rationally react in any way to this new unknown threat. So yeah. we, wouldn't, we wouldn't in any way change our behavior voluntarily um, so it, it had to be imposed on us like like mice in a in yeah, a, in, mice in a stupid. game. Yeah, yeah. If, if the experimenter doesn't move the mice where they want to go, they the dumb mice will yeah. do. Yeah, but that that you know, there's that that Hayek thing. Um, I always apply Hayek to um, uh, public policies and, and reactions because you know part of the part of the reason that central planning doesn't work is because the planners don't know nearly as much as they say they do. Right, and that. That seems to absolutely apply to this, but as it turns out, unlike that meteor hitting Earth scenario that was absolutely certain, um, those of us that were more skeptical of a centralized solution can now say, well, they're, because I've had to read up on this because of all this, all, all of all these consequences, um, it turns out that this is behaving like a virus. Yeah. And we actually do know something about that. Yeah. We yeah. have a history and we could have sort of rationally planned on how to do that, we could have uh, contra the governor of New York known that old people in nursing homes would be particularly vulnerable. Yep. Um, that didn't require a rocket science degree to figure that out, apparently. Um, but it, we, we sort of let all that out the window for this sort of central planned solution, which gets me to the, to the, to the second part of this story, and I'm thinking of Robert Higgs and mm -hmm. Crisis and Leviathan, and how the government grows every time there's a real or imagined crisis. It happened after 9-11, it happened after the Wall Street bailout, and, and it really seems to be transforming society in a way that, that is incredibly dangerous right now. I, I don't think there's been any event in our lifetime, I'm just a few years older than you, and no event in our lifetime that has been as negatively transforming as, as this one. And you're right to bring up Bob Higgs's crisis in Leviathan. One of the few silver linings around this crisis, around this crisis, is that uh, uh, it it enabled Bob and I to the, for the first time to, to co-author something together. So we we had a piece, I can't remember what it was published, oh, National Review, I think, uh, on crisis in Leviathan and the, and and the impact. And uh, uh, getting back to a point we made earlier, you and I made earlier. Uh, I'm shocked that there are so many classical liberals, libertarians, constitutional conservatives, who were aware of and would talk about the, the 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 ratchet effect that Bob identified in Crisis and Leviathan, but now do not see it for this. Oh no, we'll go back to normal. I've heard, I've had people tell me that. No, we'll go back to normal. What? And 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 uh, and it's like I'm in an alternative universe. What do you mean we'll go back to normal? Yeah, maybe, maybe restaurants will at some someday be allowed to operate at 100 percent capacity before the next virus comes, right? But but the the hygiene socialism, this is David Hart's term. Hygiene socialism seems to be here, 
and it's going to its remnants are going to stick around more than remnants it's 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 core i believe are going to haunt us for the rest of our days i fear i hope i'm wrong yeah but i think it will safetyism is the new sort of radical environmentalism yeah. and and it despite it, the fact it's not really safe but yeah, yeah put that aside yeah. well it's um i mean and i and part of part of my theory going back to the politics is that um the you know i'm, I'm old enough to remember a year ago when when they were telling us that that we had just a couple years to deal with global warming yep. before we all died. Yep. And that was so ridiculous that apparently it didn't work and yep. and we didn't sufficiently scare the public into falling in line. Yep. Um, but this this fear seems to really grip people. Yeah. People are genuinely afraid of this as opposed to being cautious and and responding in a way that um, our parents and our grandparents would have had to respond. Yeah, um, I I can't quite explain that. I can't I can't either. I can't either. I, mean, I think part of it. This is not not unique to me, of course, but these early pictures out of northern Italy with these very old people, you know, suffering. And I mean, these are horrifying pictures. And so that n- naturally attacks the amygdala of our brain. And mm-hmm. wow, that's that's more that's more immediate than global warming's consequences a few decades or centuries down yeah. the road. So there's that. Uh, which again is just uh, played up by the media, and I'm still seeing. I, I can't watch the news very much anymore, but when I do catch it, I still see it's. It's like they have this B-roll, and they keep showing these gurneys uh, uh, moving through hospitals, and they're scaring people. People tell me to. The, I had a. I had someone complain just the other day to me. Well, you're not taking account of the fact that the hospitals are overcrowded. So I go to the CDC, uh, the, the Health and Human Services website. You can get data on 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 hospital. Uh, occupancy. There's no evidence that hospitals are overcrowded. Uh, you, you see B-roll on the news; it looks overcrowded. Yeah. But uh, I don't doubt there's a hospital here, hospital there, one or two days that 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 is at capacity. But there is no evidence that U.S. hospitals are now or really ever were uh, uh, pressed for capacity. Yeah. Wanna, to wanna... just to, in such a degree to justify yeah. these lockdowns. Yeah. Like and and again, getting, getting back to localism. There were absolutely pockets of, of, of communities that were overwhelmed, yep. um, particularly in New York. Yep. Um, but the sweeping, mostly governors um, all over the country, immediately mandated, we won't take any patients except for COVID patients so that we can be ready for this surge. And they ended up destroying a lot of hospital systems yep. and keeping people with even more deadly um, diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease from from actually getting treatment. And I think once the dust settles, we're going to see just how many people we inadvertently killed with central planning of, of our healthcare system. Our, our fellow economists, those in the academy, will have a field day with research on this for decades to come. And to the extent that humanity remains rational, and I'm not sure it will, but if it does, and I don't know when it's going to come out, Matt, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, there'll be some definitive works on this. And this, I, I am quite confident, will be regarded as one of the most ridiculous, absurd, extreme, and unnecessary self-inflicted uh, 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 harms that, that, that we humans have engaged in. Uh, maybe, sh- you know, short of, you know, shooting wars. Sure. And, and you will measure those consequences and human lives lost. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, of course, that there were instances where hospitals, individual hospitals and individual cities were, 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 were uh, overcrowded. Um, but I just don't see that that issue was ever large enough to justify right. the extreme reaction. It would, it would be a classic example where um, the people with the best knowledge, the, the doctors and nurses and administrators in local hospitals, would, would know how to best manage in, in an overwhelmed situation, yeah, um, and yet we decided the governors would somehow know how to do that. Yeah, because that's what they're skilled at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, this is. Let me just make one point on this because you, you, I, I know you, you like public choice uh, economics and Jim Buchanan, and um, and although this point isn't exactly relevant for when we're in the midst of the COVID panic itself, but um, uh, I wonder to the extent, I wonder if this panic will lead to the elimination of certificate of need regulations for hospitals. So to the extent that there's a press on hospital capacity, 
a lot of this is to be blamed on the government itself. Yeah. Uh, because starting back in the 1970s, uh, and I, don't, I forget the exact details, but it, uh, uh, to, to build a hospital in a community requires that a certificate, that, that that builder receive a certificate of need. And the certificate of need is determined, whether or not it's granted, by the hospitals in the community. Well, hospitals don't like competition. Yeah. And so we have this we have this restriction on the building of hospital capacity. Yeah, it's true. Given that restriction, once a pandemic strikes, we have to deal with the with the with the congestion as it as it happens. But this is the same government, the government that insists on these uh, certificates of need. This is the same government that people are now willing to trust with power to lock society down and put us all under house arrest, put healthy people under house arrest. Yeah, and it. And this sort of uh, sometimes is a challenge to people who have sort of this romantic view of of rational government responses to things. But the that's that's just one example of where a uh, the existing um, interests, the hospitals, don't want competition. Yeah, and they have a better seat at the table with uh, maybe it's the mayor's office. Um, sometimes those are state based regulations. Um, they already got their man. Yeah, and their lobbyists at the table, and then an innovator comes in and says, "I, I think I think I could serve this community," and they and they shut it down. But you you can apply that as you know. Oh no, to we everything. have it covered. Don't worry. We we, yeah. we we don't need any more capacity here. Going back to and you know I, I sort of view um, Robert Higgs' work as as essentially a public choice exposition of of why government grows, and going back to contact tracing, I, I look at this incredibly expansive infrastructure of snoops, professional mm-hmm. government trained snoops who want to know who you took to dinner yeah. and where you go and what you do. And anyone that thinks that that goes away the day after we've cured the virus, um, that's a lot of government workers who are now feeding off of those uh, presumably well-paying jobs. And, and what is that gonna morph into? It's going to morph into other projects where we have to be snooped on and followed and and herded, perhaps, to, to behave differently. There will always be some new pathogen, some new variant. We see it now with COVID, right? There's all these new variants. That's what viruses do. They constantly mutate. This yeah. is not new. Uh, 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 so there will always be some way in which my getting close to you puts your life at a, in a slightly higher risk of being ended. And in order to protect you from that, the snoops will will snoop on me and snoop on you yeah yeah it's not it's not it's not going away um and and just the attitude you know one thing about bob higgs's book that's not appreciated it is a public choice book but he also spends a lot of time in there talking about the importance of ideas and ideology and how when people's minds change what they're willing to accept and uh, uh, from the government changes and so one of the many distressing things about this experience is that is how many people are just willing to accept being treated like a guinea pig, yeah, uh, willing to believe that the government is able and willing to save them from some particular disease, willing to believe that it makes sense to seek protection from one ailment, yeah, as at the at the at the expense of protection from other from other possible life threatening accidents and diseases. This is how people's minds have changed, and that certainly is not going away. So you get that attitude change along with the institutional change at the at the state level, the government level. Higgs's Higgs's uh, crisis in Leviathan ratchet effect kicks in. Yeah, there was a uh, uh, Evor Cummins, who you know and was a guest on my show, um, posted this piece from Der, Der Spiegel about the about the swine flu, and I forget when that happened, but not so long ago, and perhaps unintentionally, the article describes um, this the emergence of this pandemic industrial complex uh, collusion between government health agencies and NGOs, all of whom would profit immensely from dealing with a pandemic. Yeah. And they were all geared up and they were they were predicting the, the worst things possible and, and and you know everyone was going to die. but then then that particular pandemic turned out to be a dud. Um, it didn't. It didn't do the things that they promised it would do. Darn! Didn't kill enough people. But that machine, that that ecosystem of of government interests and and 
quasi-private interests. And by the way, presumably pharmaceutical companies are absolutely part of this ecosystem. Yeah. Um, businesses, nonprofits, government, um, they needed a crisis um, because it's an incredibly profitable business to be in. And, and to your point about Higgs, we now have a well-funded, expanded, incredible pandemic industrial complex, and this won't be their last fight. No, nope. they'll, nope. they'll yeah. have another one. Yeah, and, and, and people, people are not only are willing to, in many cases, sadly, are eager for this, I love that term, uh, pandemic industrial complex yeah. to kick into action. They, the, people's attitudes have changed just in the past year uh, in, in a way that makes this acceptable. And that's, so when, when you have the institutional infrastructure in place and the attitudes to support it, it's not going away. It's, it's so your, um, I think it's your blog, Cafe Hayek, um, do, do colleagues post on that or is that primarily you? That's just me. It, Russ Roberts and I founded it together. He used to blog with me, uh, but Russ hasn't blogged in, in years. He does econ talk, so it's, it's just me now. There's a comment section. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I, I'll give a shout out to that because you. you, as an academic economist, um, have a unique ability to actually comment on things in real time. One of my frustrations with academics is, as you said earlier, you know, 50 years from now, we're yeah. going to know the consequences <laughs> yeah. of, of what we just did to ourselves. But, but that, that blog in real time, you have just, just super helpful, Thank plain you. English comments on things. And I'm thinking of an article you just posted a couple days ago about the World Health Organization um, required regulations on how to categorize COVID deaths. Right, from April. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's shockingly blatant to me that they're pumping up the numbers, that they're, they're wanting the biggest, scariest number of how many people died from COVID. And, and if you remember this, describe yeah. the Describe the regulations. So, so, so this is a World Health Organization. I, I guess it's a directive. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, so I, 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 it's a directive, I guess, to the various countries who are members of the of the World Health Organization. I don't think it has any enforcement powers directly, um, but uh, the uh, the at one point in that directive, it's from April twentieth, twenty twenty. You can go to my blog and get a get a link to it. Uh, the unnamed authors of the part in that, of, that po of that directive uh, say that hospitals should record a death as, as I don't remember the exact, the exact wording, as I, either uh, with COVID, of COVID, but, but, but implicate COVID somehow, yeah. even if it's not medically proper. Yeah. So when I read someone else report on this, because I was directed to this essay by, by someone else who I now forget, I read that and I thought, this is just too extreme. This guy must be misquoting that WHO report. They wouldn't be that blatant. And surely I would have heard about this by now. Yeah. So before I posted it, I wanted to check it out. I was sure I would find that it was a mistake. Verbatim, that's what they say. Even if it's not medically appropriate. Yeah. This is the World Health Organization, it, it, as explicitly as it can possibly be, encouraging hospitals... Uh, and maybe coroners, I, I don't know who, who, who reads this directive, encouraging health officials to uh, elevate, artificially elevate the number of, of COVID deaths. Yeah. It's awful. And I want like to, to, to create a specific scenario, um, an 85-year-old man is in the hospital and he yeah. has stage four cancer and he's been fighting it for years and his days are numbered and it's just the way it is. Um, if he dies and then happens to test positive for COVID under this directive, it is a COVID death. It's either, a, it's either I, 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 I guess it varies from country to country. I want to be really careful here. Um, they can list it as with COVID or, 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 or of COVID, but it certainly gets, by the time it gets to the, to the media, it, it is lumped in surely yeah. with, with, you know, the, the COVID deaths, the number of people who are affected with COVID. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I have, there's no doubt in my mind that the number of COVID deaths in the United States and worldwide is vastly overestimated. In other words, the number of people who died because of COVID who would not have died within the foreseeable future, that number is much lower than is the number of reported COVID deaths. 
and that's that's explainable under public choice theory uh, by the simple fact that uh, governments are um, compensating at higher levels uh, treatment for COVID than other diseases. They've they've chosen the winner, yeah. And the natural incentive for hospitals is to is to make sure that um, their costs are covered. It's just the way it is. And and uh, before we started recording, you were saying there's something in the CARES Act that compensates hospitals at a higher rate. Again, I don't remember the, I don't remember the details, but in the CARES Act passed last spring, uh, there's an explicit provision in there that uh, 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 enables hospitals to claim more money from I think it's Medicare. Could be wrong. Claim more government money, right? Uh, the larger the number of of COVID cases it, that hospital deals with. Yeah. Well, naturally. So I go in for a broken leg. Uh, uh, I'm otherwise healthy. I test positive for COVID. I'm listed as a COVID case. Yeah. And, I, and the hospital gets more money for that. Yeah, I don't blame the hospital, but I blame the government for creating that sort of perverse incentive. I blame the media. Where and where's the media? In, in failing to point this out. This, this, this is a scandal. But the media, they don't point it out. They, they want to go with it because they like having these high COVID numbers because it enables them to, 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 to gin up fear and anxiety and hysteria on a, not a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about this. And I don't have a good answer for it, but I've always been sort of a Hayekian romantic about the power of hmm. decentralization of knowledge. And, and my, my old hero that I quote a lot, John Perry Barlow, um, who you may remember, he yeah, wrote the yeah. Declaration of Internet Independence yep. in 96 or something like that. And, and he had read Hayek um, uh, when he wasn't partying with the Grateful Dead. Yeah. And I think he, I learned about him from you, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, you know, he originally had this romantic view that this decentralization is going to allow for the democratization of knowledge and, and sort of break down top institutions. And I think we'll get there, but right now it looks like the opposite is happening because democratization has created all of these, these mobs and, yeah. and panics and, and, and uh, like Karens that, that try to get people canceled just for questioning the science. They, you know, the, the great Barrington, um, what is it called? The great Barrington Declar declaration. declaration which was a perfectly reasonable statement by non-ideological epidemiologists about what had been standard practice during a pandemic until just a year ago. Yeah. Um, Facebook took it down. They yeah. canceled it. Yeah. And I'm like, this this is the opposite of what the dream was supposed to be. I think they've since put it back up. It was down for a while. Oh, did they? I, I, that's what I heard. Okay. Yeah, I think they've since put it back up. But the very fact that they take it down at all. Yeah. And and it, it, I'm glad you, you mentioned the Great Barrington Declaration. If you, it's not very long. If you read it, it's it's unbelievably modest. Yeah. Right. They, 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 they're just saying, look, let's let's focus our attention on those people who, because we know who's the most vulnerable: very old people and 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 people with with compromised. Uh, respiratory systems and, and, and other sick people, right? Um, ordinary people are not that much at risk from, from COVID. Um, uh, children are at less risk from COVID. Uh, but if you haven't read the Great Barrington Declaration, but you read about it at random in the media, you would swear it was, it was drafted by devils, yeah. ignorant devils. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's shameful yeah. how it was treated. It's shameful how the three co-authors of it were and continue to be treated yeah they're um the the mob is doing everything they can to um not just deplatform them but to get them fired from their their and and their their academics i believe right so uh, uh one is at uh she's a theoretical epidemiologist i think at oxford yeah world renowned even that even i had heard of her before this right uh, the other is a medical professor at Stanford, a little school out in Palo Alto. Uh, the third is a professor at Harvard, a little school up in the up on the Charles River. Yeah, these are highly accomplished, once well-respected academics. Um, one, the one at Stanford, Jay Bichar I think his name is pronounced Bicharia. Uh, I think he's he's sort of center right. Uh, Sunitra Gupta, the Oxford epidemiologist. It admits to being very far on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Kulldorff, the the fellow at Harvard, 
I think he's center, maybe center left. This is not an ideological. It's not a. It's, it's called a libertarian document. It's nothing libertarian about it. It's just good common sense, uh, 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 written by uh, uh, very knowledgeable scientists. Yeah. yeah. And so you have this sort of um, the imagery of a of a mob sort of banging on the doors with their pitchforks and 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 flames and and it sort of completely devastates my romantic theory about how yeah. social media was supposed to work. Yeah. And I always I always quoted Ferguson on the wisdom of crowds and yeah. and democratizing knowledge was going to to lead to and and maybe I don't know, maybe Ferguson still applies because he didn't say the process was going to be beautiful. Right. He didn't say the process was going to be informed, but somehow or another um, people just figuring stuff out always sort of trumps the, the planners and the governments and the, and the wishes that they would have. Yeah, I just butchered Ferguson, but that's kind no, of no, no. Yeah, no, I think you, you, you got you got it's correct. Uh, I can choose without much difficulty to remain optimistic on that front that in the long run uh, things will work out on that front. Yeah, but I got to say, Matt, right for the past several months and to this day, I still I feel more much more pessimistic than I felt at any time in my life. I just the the mania, the, his, the hysteria that that people have hysteria in part made possible, I think, by social media, by these things that we would otherwise celebrate. Yeah, well, let's let's um, let's pivot. Uh, so we're we're wrapping up here, but um, your mission in life. I mean, you you wear multiple hats, but you but you've always been perhaps inspired by your colleague Walter Williams. You've always been someone that wanted to communicate economics to non-economists, to the public. Uh, and and I struggled from day one in this particular crisis to figure out simple ways to explain opportunity cost, yeah. costs and benefits, basic economic analysis. And and I've, I've come to the conclusion, I think, over the last year that, and maybe I was naive about it, but I, I realized that economic calculations are not the way that, that normal people's brains function. That's right. They respond to emotion, they respond to storytelling, and that's of course why Free the People does what it does because we try to tell an emotional story. But how do you communicate these very simple concepts like opportunity cost? I, well, I, I, I try to use stories. So you mentioned Walter Williams. If you read Walter Williams' columns, uh, unfortunately, of course, Walter just died a couple months ago. Uh, if you read his columns, he tells stories. And, and, and so many economists, even very good economists, uh, they, 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 they don't want to tell stories. They, they talk and write in the abstract. And that's fine if you're talking to a, a faculty seminar. But if you're trying to get ordinary people to understand what's important about economics, you have to tell stories. And you, can't, and you cannot be afraid to bring in some emotion. I mean, these are stories about the human condition about what, what costs and benefits we confront. Of course, we should. there's nothing wrong with being emotional about that. And so I, I quite consciously try to tell stories and use anecdotes and metaphors and simile. I think that people are better able to grasp the points when, when, it, when it's done that way. Yeah, and, and our mutual friend Deirdre McCloskey is, is one of the masters at this as well. Un, in, un, indisputable. Yeah. yeah, and it, it, it sort of gets to the, I try to explain Austrian economics to, to people that don't particularly care about economics, and, and I always viewed it as a form of storytelling yeah. that, um, that would relate to people because human action ultimately is, is those individual stories and in the yeah. process of people uh, living their lives. Yeah. And it was frustrating to me, you know, one of the arguments against economic um, critiques of COVID lockdowns was, well, you're talking about money and, yeah. and I'm talking about lives. Yeah. And I, economics is not about money. Yeah. It's about humans. So when I teach my principal students, my, my Econ 101 students, very first day, one of the first things I tell them is this is not a course about money. Economics is not about money. Economics is about explaining the society that you see and experience around you. Uh, money's part of that society, but economics isn't about that. Uh, economics is about about understanding how individuals confront incentives, confront constraints, they make choices, and how do all these choices build up uh, into an, an amazingly vast and complex order that, that no one has designed, that no one could possibly 
design. And that's one of the scary things about what's going on now with these COVID lockdowns is uh, the people who are imposing these lockdowns and the people who support the lockdowns, they simply do not understand the complexity of society. And so they think it's very simple. And so here's, here's the metaphor that's been going through my head or the image that's been going through my head the past few days. Have the governments, uh, they're like this big giant and they're just kicking all these, all, all these pieces of society around and they're going to fix it by showering monopoly money down on it. Oh, we, we have a stimulus. We have trillions of dollars of stimulus. No need to worry. We'll just shower monopoly money down. And they, don't, they do not understand the complexity of the arrangements that they are destroying and preventing from emerging. And these are not, this is a complexity that is not restored or maintained even by showering money down on it. And we're going to leave it there because that's a perfect way to end this. Um, how do people that are intrigued by all of this find Cafe Hayek and, and the places that you publish? Well, thanks for asking. So my, my blog, Cafe Hayek, is just www.cafehayek.com. And I put stuff up there, new stuff every day. Uh, but another site that you, you mentioned earlier, but I want to recommend to your, your viewers, is AIER, uh, the American Institute for Economic Research. I have a link to AIER at my blog, but you can just Google a, uh, AIER. And AIER, uh, under the leadership of, of GMU Econ alum uh, Edward Stringham and, and his lieutenants, particularly Jeffrey Tucker, I think they have been heroic throughout this. They have published, that's the organization that arranged for the Great Barrington Declaration to be written because AIER is headquartered in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. So I would uh, 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 highly recommend the AIER site. And uh, we talk a lot about Walter Williams on this show. And as I recall, um, the day after he passed away, you published a, a, a really nice piece in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, his Walter and I fortu fortunately were close. It was a great blessing in my life. And uh, I heard from uh, his daughter that morning that he died. And um, I then wrote this piece in the Wall Street Journal, accepted it. So it was out within 24 hours. Amazingly, it was out within 24 hours of his of his death. Walter's last column, which was published about nine days after his death, his last syndicated column, uh, was one that praised the Great Barrington Declaration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Well, so, thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.